Good morning, everybody. Uh, I work for the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in the Florida Keys, and what I'm going to be talking today is a, a little bit different than artificial reef, but I think when you see what I'm going to show you guys, this information can be applied to many sites, many areas of science, and I see the, the, connect, the relationship with what we do and the artificial reef can be applied for many areas of research. Uh, our work is mostly in the Florida Keys, and the mission for us is to try to evaluate the efficiencies of the marine research that have been established in the Florida Keys and the different management strategies that the Commission is using during the, next, uh, the last 10 years to evaluate these areas. So, we're using telemetry. Why are we using telemetry? Telemetry is a tool that is becoming every day more and more affordable, and the technology is there to be used. We're using terrestrial for many ways to indicate how animals, animal moves, how they use different habitats, and how the, is the connectivity between regions and areas. So when this becomes available for the marine field, we started to use this in, probably the first time we did it was in 2007, and since then we've been using it constantly for different areas and different, for many species. And in this case, the way how I'm gonna give the presentation, I'm gonna have some case studies in which we use this technology to demonstrate how it can be used to look at different phases and evaluate systems. Uh, why do we need it? We really need to have a better understanding of how precise the animals move and how precise the animals use habitats. What is the connect connectivity about different habitats? In our case, we're talking about reef systems. So we want to see what is the connectivity among pat reef patches, about near shore areas, about spawning irrigation sites, deep water, and different areas. Where can we use? I, I think I should be moving. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, why is use acoustic telemetry? What I was referring, you can estimate a small scale movement, identify habitat, site fidelity, home range. And you can use, also use it to validate or to get more precise estimations of fishing mortality and natural mortality. Uh, where can we use it? We can use it basically anywhere. Uh, we can use it in cold water, deep water, shallow water, high noise, long distance and short distances, and with other, any other techno technology that is available to use. Now, it's a very powerful tool to use. But don't, don't get me wrong, it's a, it has a lot of limitations. So one of the limitations that we used to have at the beginning is that was a very expensive technology. Still, it's a very expensive technology when you consider what you spend and what you use. The other thing is you cannot use it in very small fish. So small fish doesn't have the tax sizes that we use. It cannot be implemented on them, and you have to use different technology than the one I'm talking today. Uh, one of the big limitations you want to find is that you need to have uh, very good people to analyze the data because it will generate large numbers of data and you need to have an idea what that data really means and how that data can be used. And at the same time, when you design your experiment, you have to be able to have in mind what do you really want to get. So because when you're setting your array and you're defining all your strategies, you have to have all this information already on mind to see the information you're going to get and how you're going to analyze it. Uh, I said before, it's becoming very spent. It, it used to be very expensive. It's be, it becoming very, more affordable. And every day that pass, the companies that produce these technologies are more willing to work with scientists and to design systems and design tags and design uh, units that will allow us to accommodate our needs. The way how I wanted to approach this presentation, I was going to have give you an idea of four different case studies that we use in four different regions in the Florida Keys. Uh, one of them is gonna be talking about spawning movement in the dry tortugas. The other one will be fish behavior and we will try to do an analysis about in the middle keys using lionfish. This will be an inshore study. Then we have a marine reserve efficiency that we did in the Western samples and we use an species in particular red groupers. And then I borrow from one of my colleagues, some, a lady who's working with me uh, some information and acoustic telemetry done in the Gulf of Mexico for reef fish, trigger fish. The, uh, the first case is going to be the case, the dry tortugas area. 
In 2007, the, the National Park Safety Service and the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission came, a, came out with an MOU to develop a new area of this, what is what's called this research natural area. At that time, we were asked, how can we evaluate to see the efficiency of this new protected area in relation to the other ones? So if you, in here you can see, uh, it's a map of the dry tortugas with the different areas where they are. The black dots mean the acoustic receivers that we have, and the white point triangles are the places where we, we tag fish. So basically we wanted to see how these fishes move and how they use these different marine reserves throughout the year, and how more especially in the south, in this area here, if the tortugas have ecological reserves, that was a very uh, well-known spawning aggregation site for mutton snappers. And it's a multi-species ag aggregation site and was overfished, was closed. And we wanted to see, is that area recovering? So are we really seeing any pattern? So at that time, the idea was to tag fishes in this area, in this area, and all around this area to see how they move, what was the home range, and what was the pattern and seasonality and special use of those habitats. Uh, working in there, in the Tortugas, soon we realized that all the tagging time we were doing, we were having problems with barotrauma. trauma. Every fish time we were work, go, bringing back, we were having problems because we're really dying or we were not able to release, and the time time we keep it in the boat was too long to really see if there was any effect of the tagging because what you do, you do an insertion in the abdomen and you, in, uh, you implant an acoustic tag and it's gonna be detected by those receivers. So every time the fish move nearby those receivers, we will know when we're there, what time of the day, and how, uh, for how long they stay in the area. So in here you see, after having so many problems with doing these surgeries on the boat, we decided that the only way to do that was to do surgeries on the boat. So we conduct all our surgeries for all the fishes and all the cases that we're gonna be doing here, they're done in the water. In the dry tortugas, then it's a, a little bit deeper there. We only probably can do one or two fish at a time, but uh, probably one of the, Mike was involved in that, he's a, he's a very sur good surgeon. But here, that's what we do. And the, the rate of survival is very high. We haven't had very few mortality when we do the surgeries on the water and the fish can be released and they live and they stay wherever. We have a, to the point and when we recapture that fish, sometimes we don't even notice that that fish was top, eh, tagged before because they lost the external tag. And when we open them, we find that they already have one tag. So what were the results of all this experiment? So remember I mentioned you have the, the RTO, RNA, Tortugas North and Tortugas South. For the case of the, of the mountain snappers, as you can see, as the full moon of the summer, they spawn during the summertime, and as the full moon start coming up, these fish will move down, will go to the Tortuga South, stay there for seven days, spawn, and then come back to his house and wait for the next full moon the following month. It will do the same movement again, go to the Tortuga South, spend there seven days, after do the spawning, come back, back home, and stay in the same place that was his home range, stay there until the next full moon will come. We have, we tagged 55 fish. Of those one, we had 21 fish that did this pattern. We, there were 15 fish and we didn't know what they did because they probably went somewhere else. And some of them were resident of the Tortuga South and some of them were resident of the Tortuga North. So we were able to establish that there is a clear connectivity, spatial and temporal connectivity for spawning aggregations of these species. So you can argue or you can say, if you have the time, the, the period where you do the tagging and you know the spatial and the temporal connectivity, you can create spawning corridors to protect those species during the spawning. And that aggregation has been recovering during the last 20 years. And right now we have very good, uh, this is happening every year. Uh, the second case I wanna talk about is a, a little bit more one related to fish behavior and it's related to lionfish. And we wanted to know what was the residency and the, the, the activity of the lionfish 
in a small patch or patches of inshore areas. Why? Because everybody's talking about eradication of lionfish. But are we really targeting, one way to see this, are we really targeting the eradication and the capture of lionfish at the moment and they have more activity? Do we really know at what time during the day or during, uh, or, or, or what days are they really moving the most and they're gonna be more efficient for harvest? So to do that, we did exactly the same thing that we did in the Tortugas, but in a small scale, we went into uh, local patches and we tagged lionfish when we tried to estimate how, how was the site fidelity to the, to the reef and at the same time, what were the patterns of activities that they had. Again, we did this system. We collected lionfish and the tagging. The tagging was also done underwater because we also noticed that even though it was shallower, we were having problems with fish mortality by bringing them into the boat and try to keep them on the boat. And we have become so proficient doing it underwater in deeper water than we felt that our, all our surgeries should be done underwater. And here we, see, we noticed and there was some clear difference uh, in the residency of the, of the lionfish. They stay mostly during the whole time in the same place where they were during the whole period. So they were very, a very high side fidelity. They were not really moving among different reefs, only in the reef track. And it's probably that's due because the reef track is very large and have a lot of habitats and they can really move throughout the habitat. But when they are in patches or a small, uh, a small reef, they tend to stay in a high fidelity environment. But the most important thing that we noticed was that the peak of activities happen during the sunset and, sun, and, and sunrise. So during the day, they were basically sheltered. There was hardly any lionfish that were outside. You need to look for them and they were in crevices. But if you go early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you will see more activity and they were out foraging and doing more things. So if you're gonna def define a project and you really wanna eradicate lionfish, at least in this area that we were working, the pigs to go to harvest would be early in the morning and late in the afternoon. In uh, here we can see that, you know, there are clear, the very clear patterns and when we use the acoustic telemetry, we can, the different dots, you will say, the black dots are activities where they were during the night, the red, uh, the red one was the twilight, and then the yellow one during the day. And we can see there was a very clear, significant difference of activity during the twilight. I, I, I'm moving fast because I have a lot of slides to go there. So the conclusions are that the majority of the lionfish remain, remain between the array and between their have very high side fidelity. There are very distinct activity patterns and they're gonna happen during sunset and sunrise and there are small activity do, during the twilight, okay? Now we, we're moving into a different one and this was the first one that we did with acoustic telemetry. This happened from 2003 to 2008 when we started to do acoustic telemetry. And this was like a side project because we were doing at that time acoustic telemetry with Losters. We were trying more to evaluate how much luster were moving between the marine reserves in the Florida Keys. And in this case, we're going, to, we're going to use two different approaches because we're trying to evaluate the efficiency of the 23 marine protected areas that we have in the Florida Keys National Marine Center. So we're trying to see at the size of the protected areas at the, at, uh, of the reserves uh, good enough to, pro to protect uh, in this case, red grouper. So what we do, we use acoustic telemetry to estimate the horn range. We wanna know what is the horn range of the red grouper, how much did he move, how, much, how wide is his horn range, and how big is in relation to the marine protected areas, uh, the, the marine reserve areas that we have. And also we use what is called, uh, a project that we have that is called underwater fish counts. So we go, this is the Western Sanborn Ecological Reserve. And uh, here we have the areas where we tag, is the yellow points, and then we have the acoustic receivers and they will be, will be the, the triangles. And the borders, the lines, mean the area of the Western Sanborn Reserve. The Western Sanborn is one of the largest ones that we have in the Keys, and 
there are only really two large marine reserves. And then we want to use the data that we collect from our risk visual sensors. It's something that we have count, we count fish throughout the Florida Keys. Um, we do that with different, it's a multi-agency approach. Uh, we have a very large uh, sample size, a very robust data set. It's a data that we have been starting to use for stock assessment because it's a very good index of fishers independent. So in that way, we know we can estimate how many red groupers we have in all the marine, res uh, marine reserve areas than they are in the Keys, plus we have the home range. So what we did, we estimated home range, and we estimated that the average home range for red grouper was about two kilometers. Okay, so having that number in, in mind and having the density that we have of reef fish, we can go and evaluate the efficiency or evaluate how good are the preserved areas in the Keys to protect, in this case, red grouper. Uh, this is a case with red grouper. We have done it. We have black grouper. We have yellowtail snapper. We have muttons. We have all the other species, but in this case, and I, I choose red grouper. I did something wrong. So, like I said before, we only have 23 zones of uh, reserves in the Keys. Only two of them have a, uh, an area larger than the home range of the red grouper. So it will be Caris 4 and it will be the Western Sambos Reserve. All the other ones, the average will be 0.62 kilometers. So it's really very small in relation to red grouper home range. So what happened when you, you do that? So we have the, what we call the unprotected areas. We have the small notate reserves at those ones and they are less than two kilometers. And then you have the large one and they will be the only two and they have more than five kilometers to protect. And as you can see here, in the, at the beginning, all the, the black bars and it's the large notate, the large notate tends to have more red grouper legal sizes because the home range is larger than their, the, the, the reserve area is larger than the home range. So they have more place to wander and to move so they are really more protected from fishing. So the message in, the, in this case will be, if you have an information on home range, you can really, if you're gonna protect an area or you're gonna set some kind of protection for that species, you should consider that when you're gonna see so size of the area will have, have an effect. Uh, the same thing happened throughout the year. This is trying to show uh, densities in the three areas, protected, unprotected, and small reserve throughout the years. And you can see them all the large reserve areas, the, the two areas, all we have larger red grouper than the other ones, and they are not. And when you try to pull it by habitat and reef track, you see the same pattern too. Then all the, the even if you, you have a stratification for habitat and you have protection in habitat, you will see that the largest protect um, reserve, uh, marine reserve is the one that is gonna protect the largest red grouper and where you're gonna see more of the largest individuals. So this is a, a, a way in where you can say having different multi techniques and multiple, multiple approach to evaluate resources, it can give you a more clear picture of how you can protect or how you can manage uh, an area. In this case, by using acoustic technology and using visual sensors, we were able to say these, are, these, these areas were better than the other. And at the moment that you provide this information to managers, and it's, for example, in the case of National Marine Sanctuary, then they are trying to do rezoning of their, their areas by having home range information and uh, fish count or density information, they can really think about how they're gonna establish these new areas. Uh, now we're going about one thing, and less familiar too, because this work was not conducted in my lab, in my office. This was conducted for a colleague and is working for us now, but she was working in the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf of Mexico had been doing a lot of research, especially in Harvard University and Texas A&M, and I think University of Florida, tagging and doing acoustic tagging in artificial reef and try to, to provide 
uh, what is the area and the of effect of what we would call probably the effective area of influence of the artificial reef in relation to species. Uh, here they use a, a little bit of different technology. It's still acoustic technology. It's still used for Benko, but it's what is called is a BPS system. Uh, then it's a Benko positional system. And what it consists is that you have five different receivers that you connect, you, 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 you align at the same distance from the artificial reef or from the place. The square will be the artificial reef. You have a center receiver and you have all these receivers around and the distance is exactly the same because there is an overlap because you're gonna do a triangulation and this kind of the uh, acoustic array will give you a more precise, a more a, a specific place where that fish was. The other one, and when you don't use a BPS system, you know that the fish is being there, but you really don't know in what direction or where it is coming from. So you need to have a more, in, in the previous cases than we had before because the area was so large, so you, you have less information than this one. But here, for example, you can see it and they estimate the homing behavior. The yellow circle is where the fish spend most of the time. The red one here around is what it will be the 95% areas where they really wander during the day or before if they do a spawning of foraging and things like that. But at the same time shows that they go to another artificial reef and there is a connectivity between the two of them. Okay. Uh, in the case of the lionfish, remember the activity was happening mostly sunset and sunrise. In this here, in the case of triggerfish, is all the contrary. The, all the activities happening during the daytime. And during the early mornings and late at night, the fish is not there. So it's either being protected from predation or it's not eating, but the activity of them is different. So that gives you uh, also a good feeling of what is the behavior for foraging, foraging and all the activity of the fish. Uh, okay. So in that case, in the conclusion for that, they have a very high side fidelity, significant difference doing to season and dial. They were found for the tiger fish and BPS is a very uh, good technology to get very precise estimates of where the fishes are coming from. And for in the case of the artificial reef, if you want to know how close you can set your artificial reef or how close these fish are going to be, this is probably going to be the system that you're going to use. Uh, like I said before, there are several papers that work in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is yes only some pre few ones that I, I wanted to put there. And um, trying to wrap up this acoustic tel telemetry is a very effective technology to monitor reef fish, especially to get an uh, information about habitat utilization and how they move, allow, allow us in our case to evaluate the efficiencies of the reserve that we use. It's also, also allowed us to see if there is different during the season and the del periodicity of, this, of the species. It's an incredible tool to evaluate the spawning aggregations, to see how fishes can do that uh, that behavior for reproduction, how they are, and it has been crucial to support and trying to uh, protect those, those moments where these, those fishes are so vulnerable to fishing. Uh, it gives us a very good fisheries independent estimate of fishing and natural mortality. It, can be, it has been used a lot for modeling, and with that, having acoustic telemetry into the models will allow us to get a more precise estimate of survivals and mortalities that really can enhance the stock assessment. And trying to wrap it up for artificial reef. So uh, this is not my field and I try to put some ideas of how I can see this. Um, for example, habitat placement. It would be very probably very good to go to have a home range or to have an idea of the different species that you wanna work or you are targeting at the moment that you have it placing uh, artificial reef in different habitats. Uh, for example, are the type of the habitats more uh, so, uh, efficient for some kind of species or the other? Uh, will the deployability of the, of the uh, artificial reef during the time of the year or during the season will affect the residency of the different species? Are uh, some species like Goliath group that have been mentioned in several times 
Are they using artificial reef only just to go for shelter or then during some time of the year they become uh, aggregation sites? And it will probably help into the production and the, the debate between production and attractions, you know. Uh, these are uh, structures are really moving fish from other areas so you can know exactly where those fishes will come and how they will share and what is the connectivity among them. Uh, I think th th this is, an, I apologize for being so quick <laughs> and trying to put all this together, but uh, I think the important thing is that all these technologies are available and every day are becoming more, more affordable to be used and it's something that having information about the fish behavior and how they move and the connectivity among the different habitats is crucial at the moment that you're trying to establish any structure or any, uh, you're trying to develop any structure or any habitat in any place so you can see what is the connectivity among them and how it will be influencing the environment. And if you have any questions, I don't know if I have questions. Yeah, time for